Welcome back to Old Western Culture. We're in the fourth unit of year two on the Romans. This fourth unit is on the uh, Nicene Christians. So let me move on now to John Chrysostom the third. Now I said that these, the first three, Basil the Great, his brother Gregory Nyssa, and Gregory Nazianzus are called the three Cappadocians because they come from Cappadocia. But two of those, Gregory the Great, his friend Gregory Nazianzus, uh, and then also John Chrysostom are considered by the Eastern Orthodox Church the three holy hierarchs, the three great hierarchs, or sometimes the three ecumenical hierarchs, because those three were such potent defenders of Christian doctrine in the fourth century. Basil on the Holy Spirit, uh, Gregory Nazianzus on the Trinity generally, and John Chrysostom on a practical, profound exposition of the Christian life in his homilies and so on. So John Chrysostom here uh, is uh, also important. His name Chrysostom uh, it comes from uh, the Greek. The word Chrysostom means golden-mouthed. So his name was actually John, John of Antioch, because that's where he was born. But he's called John Chrysostom, John the golden Mouth, because his oratory was so great. He's considered the greatest preacher of the ancient world. Um, he uh, has been esteemed all through history. He's especially loved by the Eastern Orthodox, but he's also loved in the Western Church. Uh, John Calvin uh, uh, loved him greatly and quoted him quite frequently. Uh, Chrysostom is considered the great preacher, and for a number of reasons. One, uh, because uh, in his preaching, he's uh, very practical. Uh, unlike the Alexandrians, uh, uh, he, he is more like the Antiochian school, uh, as, 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 as uh, historians say, uh, in his interpretation, in his exegesis. He's less allegorical, sticks more strictly to the literal sense of the, of the passages. Not that, not that allegorical interpretation is necessarily bad, but because Chrysostom is talking to the common people of Constantinople and Antioch where he served, he, he sticks to the literal sense of the text and is very practical. And so theologians and, and the preachers all through history have loved him for that. Uh, but also because uh, he was a great uh, denouncer of pride and arrogance especially on the part of the rich. And so that comes into play uh, in the story of his life, uh, which I'll uh, try to cover briefly here. He's born in Antioch, has a Christian mother, uh, a widow. His father died young. Uh, her name is Anthusa. Uh, she uh, causes her son, uh, John, to be raised uh, well-educated, well-trained in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in classical education, the liberal arts and so on. He studies under a pagan orator named Libanius, uh, who was so impressed with young John's abilities that later he said, if the Christians hadn't got him, he would have been one of our greatest rhetoricians. Well, as it turns out, John was probably a, a much greater rhetorician because he was a Christian. Uh, he uh, is, becomes a, um, a, a great preacher, a great teacher, uh, as a presbyter, a priest in Antioch, where he composes or preaches, uh, and people wrote down, uh, many of his homilies. He wrote uh, tremendous homilies on the Gospels, on, the, uh, on Paul's epistles, uh, and so on. And he also uh, gave a number of lectures on, um, uh, on uh, uh, catechetical issues, that is, uh, basic issues that candidates for baptism needed to hear to know what Christianity is basically about. But um, uh, later on, uh, 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 there's a, a tumult erupting in Constantinople. The old bishop of Constantinople, who's the patriarch, kind of the leader of the Eastern Christian uh, Church, he dies, and unbeknownst to John, he is nominated and elected the, the patriarch of Constantinople without his knowledge. Uh, now he knows this, was this will cause tumult, and so there's various stories here. Some people say that he went secretly to Constantinople from Antioch because the people of Antioch would riot if they lost their bishop. But uh, uh, John knows that God is calling him to Constantinople. Another story says that he was taken against his will, literally kidnapped, wrapped in chains, thrown in an ox cart in the middle of the night and hauled from Antioch to Constantinople to be made the, the, uh, the patriarch there. And when they take the chains off in Constantinople, he shrugs and say, says, it must be God's will. The people, are, the people want this. But in either case, it's kind of uh, at least a, uh, against his initial understanding that he becomes patriarch, but he does become the great bishop and patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, by the way, Gregory Nazianzus had been patriarch a couple of guys before him. Uh, in Constantinople, John does a number of things that really freak out the population in good and bad ways. Uh, he does not hold, he, in fact, he flatly refuses to hold the lavish, rich banquets that uh, the Christian bishops and high-ranking Christian officials of the time had come to expect. He thought, 
oddly enough, that the vast uh, um, uh, financial resource, resources of the church should be devoted to the poor. And so instead of hosting lavish banquets for visiting bishops and preachers who came to Constantinople expecting to be entertained, he didn't do that, uh, which uh, caused them to be disgruntled. But he also he sold off the gold plate and the, and the, and, and the silver uh, um, uh, uh, dishes and bowls and so on that were used in the, in, the, in the liturgy. He sold them to make money to give to the poor. So the poor of Constantinople loved him dearly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he thundered railingly and, and, and savagely against uh, the uh, oppression and the luxuriousness and the wasteful spending of the rich. Not that he thought being rich was bad, but that the rich should use their, their riches as gifts from God to protect the poor and to help the poor. Uh, in fact, uh, he thundered so thunderously uh, against the rich and the aristocratic of the city, and especially against things like uh, dressing up and extra finery and so on, that the Empress of Constantinople herself, a woman named Eudoxia, who was the, uh, the, 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 the queen of Constantinople, her husband was the Emperor Arcadius, uh, she took it personally and thought that John Chrysostom was preaching against her, uh, and he probably was. Uh, and so she was. She she hated him, wanted to get rid of him because he was causing uh, problems, uh, telling the people that she was, you know, a, 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 an oppressive rich person. And so she conspired with some other people uh, against him. And at a council called the Synod of the Oak in 403 uh, A.D., uh, they have him exiled from Constantinople on trumped-up charges that he held to a prior heresy, the heresy of Origenism. Uh, be that as it may. Uh, within a very short period of time, the people of Constant Constantinople were so upset that their beloved patriarch was exiled that they rioted in the streets, and to preserve peace, the Empress Eudoxia had to call John back into the city. He comes back into the city, and what does he do? He immediately starts thundering against the, the, the rich again, uh, uh, so much so that she gets really angry. There's a famous painting by a 19th century faint, a French painter uh, that depicts John Chrysostom standing up on his pulpit in Hagia Sophia, the great church of Christendom, with his arms spread wide and looking up to the gallery above him where the princess, the empress Eudoxia, is looking down, her face red and angry. And he's looking up at her and th he's thundering at her against her sins, not of being rich, but of neglecting the poor and not using her riches as a blessing to the poor. And so as a result of this, the fact that he is utterly intractable and refuses to uh, behave himself and not preach against the oppression of the rich, he's exiled again by the Empress Eudoxia, sent off to, to, uh, to the Caucasus Mountains, which is in eastern modern-day Turkey, east of Cappadocia, on the east end of the Black Sea. Uh, and uh, in, 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 in the Caucasus Mountains there, he's, uh, he writes letters back to his church in Constantinople, encouraging the people, encouraging them to be faithful and so on. In fact, uh, he makes such a nuisance of himself in his letters that the prince, that the Empress Eudoxia gets further angry, uh, further angered. She's tearing her hair out. Why can't I get rid of this guy? Even in exile, he's a problem. And so she has him exiled even further to way up into the uh, northeastern part of the Black Sea uh, under, uh, um, uh, to, to be escorted under guard and to, and to go off into some remote region. He never makes it. He dies in the snow and the cold of the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, in the year 407, and his last words are said to have been, glory be to God for all things. Uh, just a tremendous, tremendous uh, Christian voice uh, in the late 4th century and early 5th century. Uh, so um, uh, his homilies and his, uh, and his uh, preaching are well remembered, and, and the passages that you've read are illustrative of his skill and his eloquence. Uh, in his Paschal Sermon, uh, you see, it's very short, uh, you see him saying, um, uh, let, uh, let those who are poor, let those who are oppressed, let those who are discouraged, let everyone who's fallen under the burdens of life come to Christ. And at the end of the sermon, he says, because, and you notice, you notice what the because is, because Christ has triumphed over sin, over death, over hell, all the things that are the consequence of the fall of man in Adam, all those things, all the consequences, all the penalties that fall on us, Christ has taken on and destroyed them. Uh, to this day, in the Eastern Orthodox churches, every Easter they sing a hymn, Christ has trampled down death by death, and so on. Uh, and that's exactly what John Chrysostom is saying in, in here, because Christ has destroyed those things, because he's conquered sin and death and hell. And by the way, if you think about their famous, uh, all, the, all the most beloved Christmas carols and Christmas hymns that we sing, look how often these, this, these expressions show up there. 
uh, that Christ has conquered, Christ has come into the world in order uh, to die and rise again and in his resurrection showing that he's, uh, that he's triumphed over sin and death and hell. And so at the end of his famous Paschal Sermon, which is quite short, but very powerful and very punchy, uh, we can see this attitude that Christ has destroyed all the things that keep us in bondage. And so we should rejoice. And the whole thrust of his Paschal Sermon is one of joy, of rejoicing, uh, of light and of glory and so on. And many, many churches, not just Orthodox, but, uh, but many churches worldwide in all communions like to read this sermon on Easter. And it's well worth it. In the other selections that I had you read from Chrysostom, the first two baptismal or catechetical lectures, uh, we see an example of the way he preached uh, to, the, uh, to the new Christians in the church. Um, it, uh, and of course, you can read more. They're all delightful. But I had to read the first two just uh, to, uh, to illustrate the way that he preaches. Uh, you can see in the first one, he's warm, he's welcoming, he's inviting, uh, he's uh, encouraging uh, these new Christians to come into the faith, to guard their hearts. Uh, and in the second uh, baptismal lecture, you can see uh, it happens to be on um, avoiding finery in dress. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a caution against, uh, he happens to be talking about, uh, about women a lot in the second baptismal lecture, but not because he's picking on them particularly. It's just that uh, women in Constantinople in his day, around 400 AD, wealthy Roman women who are becoming Christians have a real struggle against them, as all Christians, men and women both would, uh, in avoiding and throwing off the worldliness that, is, that so ensnares them. In all of his sermons, and here particularly, you can see that he's concerned about this. Uh, he doesn't think that beauty is bad. What he thinks is that worldliness is bad. Dressing like the world, putting on finery like the world, following the latest fashions, dolling up in things so that you can earn the glory and the applause uh, and even the lustful glances of people around you is a serious, serious problem for the Christian. It's a real stumbling block. And so uh, in this lecture, you can, you can see a, a, an example of how John Chrysostom is uh, concerned out of love for his Christian flock, that they devote themselves to Christ solely, even at the cost of, uh, uh, of uh, the adulation of the world and the admiration of the world. It's not that we have to be uh, 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 weird and ugly and dowdy for its own sake, but that we should be careful about following the world, uh, both in externals and in internals, as he says, uh, because they lead, uh, they lead our hearts astray from devotion to Christ. Um, and he thinks uh, so seriously about this that, we, that um, uh, uh, it's well worth, uh, uh, worth our reading to see just how radical these early Christians think the change and the devotion to Christ should be. It's not just a superficial thing. It's a, uh, it's a deeply rooted thing uh, in, uh, in a person's own heart. Uh, so um, uh, if you uh, liked those first uh, two baptismal lectures, I certainly encourage you to read more. They're available in all kinds of places online and in print. So uh, uh, Chrysostom is well worth reading. His homilies, of course, are, are, are very delightful and very well worth reading. Uh, he's loved by all branches of Christendom. I've mentioned the Eastern Orthodox a number of times just because he's probably their favorite early church father, uh, as uh, Augustine is probably the West's favorite early church father. Uh, and that's where we're going next. We're going to be talking about Augustine, uh, the, uh, the Western church's favorite church father, in our next lecture. To prepare yourself for the next lecture, read the first five books of Augustine's Confessions. Uh, we'll be talking about them. Uh, take a look as you read, first of all, uh, at how Augustine is writing this. Who is he talking to? How is he talking? You know, who's his audience? Uh, and, and along that line, why is this called Confessions? What is he confessing? Uh, secondly, uh, look at how he talks about uh, how God is with him, even when he didn't know it. First as, a, as an infant, of course, and then uh, as a young man who's rejecting uh, God and looking for truth in other places. Uh, look at the things that Augustine is confessing about his youth, uh, about his, his upbringing, his growth. Uh, and uh, all the way through this book, uh, we'll be talking about how Augustine is seeking satisfaction for his soul, seeking truth. And so uh, look at the very opening, the very first paragraph where he says that God has made us for himself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in God. That will be the theme for the entire book. So pay attention to that and then look how he fleshes out this theme as he tells the story, the autobiography, the, 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 his own spiritual life and progress toward Christ.